folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. I have, um, I have up here some old friends, some, uh, some old friends that I, I used to hang around. I, I don't hang around them much anymore. Uh, they're still around, but I just don't have anything to do with them anymore. These are all um, Bibles. Well, they're kind of like Bibles. Here is the oldest friend that I've had, the best friend that I've ever had. This is, this is the King James Version of the Bible. These are all, let me tell you what I have up here. This is, uh, this is a new King James Bible with uh, this really weird symbol on the front of it. We've talked about that before. Um, I have my um, life application, new international version of the Bible. I actually bought this for my wife several years ago. She took one look at it and said, I don't like it. I get really upset because I spent a lot of money on this thing, and uh, I'm glad now that she didn't like it. Uh, this is the, uh, the the NIV. This is one that like everybody's using now. Uh, let's see here. I have my New American Standard Bible with <laughs> cheated my way through college. This is my Greek interlinear Bible. It's the New American Standard and has the one of the one of the Greek texts, not the same Greek text that this was based on, and there's a difference. Um, they, well, I didn't even like to touch this one. This is the Living Bible here. Ugh. It's a paraphrase. Um, this is the Bible that had the phrase "sob" in it. I don't know if you knew that or not. Okay, we'll we'll see that in a minute. Um, here we have uh, oh, what what is this one here? I think this is the New Revised. Standard Version. The Revised Standard Version was basically the product of what Westcott and Hort were trying to do uh, with the King James. Uh, let's see here. What else we have up here? We have, this is interesting. This is the book. Okay. And notice there's light streaming out of the pages of this thing. Uh, it's all about marketing people and eye candy. I just happened to open up the front of the book. It's the New Living Translation. You see, the Living Bible was just a paraphrase. It was very poorly done. People would read it and say, you know, I, I think I can read this better. Uh, the New Living Translation came as uh, they were trying to correct a lot, a lot of stuff that was in here. I found this interesting, and I don't know if this is on the front of all these Bibles, but I suspect that we're close. Um, this is the copyrighted New Living Translation, Tyndall House. Uh, I found this in here. Publication of any commentary or other Bible reference work produced for commercial sale that uses the New Living Translation requires written permission. You want to use this Bible, you better call us first. I don't I have a problem with that. You see, I, I, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why they want, if you're going to write a commentary and use this Bible in your commentary or some other book, then you're going to sell it. They want money. They want a piece of the pie is what it is. So this is the New Living Translation. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Well, that's interesting. I didn't plan that. Uh, six different translations of the Bible. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. and I, I just kind of know how this works because these used to be my old friends. Um, you, you're told, if you go to churches now, you're told that really the only way to really, really understand uh, the Bible. Understand what God said is to open all of these up, spread them out, and just read every one of them. I get to get all the words together. the The problem is, is that this one will say something that this one won't. This one here will say something that this one won't. They're, they they kind of kind of confusing. Remember, remember the Tower of Babel. They were all saying things weird, and people couldn't understand where they were coming from, so they said, ah, let's scatter out here. I can't understand these people anyway. Uh, and, and I will say that practically all of these will disagree with this one in thousands, thousands of places. In fact, in fact, let's, let's hear. Let's get the NIV Bible, okay? Uh, now, it looks, if we were to compare it, it looks about as big as the King James well, as with most food, they put a lot of fillers in here to make it big. There's actually 64,000 less words in this Bible than there is this one. 
Wonder what they changed. Wonder what they took out. You'll hear, you'll hear them say, well, it's just the these and the thous. That's, that's really all they did. That's not true. Or you'll hear them, as I heard my college professors say, no point of doctrine is, uh, has ever been damaged or changed by these changes that they've made in the new Bibles. No, no doctrine whatsoever is, is ever changed. And I went, yeah, okay, cool, because I wanted to do what my college professors told me to do. Uh, except cheat in Greek class. Um, and so anyway, we won't talk about that. Um, they said no doctrine was changed. No doctrine, there's no doctrinal difference between all of these Bibles, all these new translations, and the King James. They, they say that, but I disagree. I mentioned last week, in last week's Watchman broadcast, that at one time, Right after Bible college, I was out to make my mark in the church, and I was going to build this big church and have all these people come in, and, and everybody was going to say nice things about Mike Hoggard. That's what I wanted. And uh, so I was going to follow Rick Warren. I was going to do whatever he was doing. If he said, yeah, I'll bring in a bunch of music in your church, that's what I was going to do. Uh, wear blue jeans and tennis shoes and your shirt hanging out and, you know, scraggly beard and hair sticking up in the air. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be cool. It doesn't really work for me. Um, but then I, I, God chastened me over that. And now that I look back, I'm, I'm just sort of angry. I'm angry at myself for letting myself get in that condition. I'm angry at uh, Rick Warren for deceiving me. At that same time, I was just making up my mind that, oh, well, you know, you just can't use a King James anymore because people don't really understand that anymore. I was on the phone with a pastor this just this morning, and he was telling me, Mike, he said, I, I got invited to a men's conference. He said there was a thousand men there, and he said there was preacher, one preacher after another. He said not one of those preachers used the King James Bible, and he said, that, he said, I was the only one there that I could see that had a King James Bible in the midst. And he said, I'm trying to get young preachers to come and preach at my church. He said, I can't find them anymore. That, that, he said, one that I talked to. He said, I told him flat out, you need to use the King James Bible, the authorized King James Bible when you preach in my church. And he said, a new King James? He said, no, the authorized King James Bible. And the, and the young, young minister said, well, um, I, I'll, see if I can, I'll see if I can find one. I've, I've heard that before. Nobody, nobody is using this book anymore. And I think there's a reason behind it. I, I think uh, we, we did a Watchman broadcast here a while back called Corruption. And I think there's corruption moving in. And I think, I think there's an agenda behind it. And I just started, uh, God had me doing some study last week. And I just started going through in places in the Bible where it looks like, it looks like there's a cover-up. There's a cover-up amongst... This is a conspiracy right here. You have all these different Bible publishers, all these different Greek experts and Hebrew experts, and all these different people rewriting the Bible. And they're all in on the conspiracy. They're all in on the cover-up. They're trying to conceal something. What is it that they're trying to conceal? And I'm going to show you in this that they're trying to conceal the identity of the devil and the identity of the Antichrist. I'm going to show you that. Let's examine the scriptures. Let's find out whether what I'm saying is true or not. Okay, we're going to compare. We're going to compare this with all these guys over here. My my, my old old friend with my old friends that I don't hang around anymore. Let's compare. Uh, let's let's go to the scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33. Here's what the Bible says: Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Here we go. Right off the bat. Be not deceived. Is it possible? You have to ask yourself the question, is it possible that church people are being deceived right now? And the answer, of course, is yes. That's why the Bible over and over is warning us not to be deceived because it is possible to deceive people. How is that deception coming? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Okay? And by manners, it doesn't mean uh, don't put your elbow on the table, don't burp in front of people. It's not what that's talking about. Your mannerisms, your lifestyle, how you live. These things come to us from the true, incorruptible Word of God. Good thing. The Bible says all good things come from God. So if there's good manners and good lifestyles that we have, they come from the Bible. But 
don't be deceived. Evil communications will corrupt good manners. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16, listen to this. But shun profane and vain babblings. Let me stop right here. Remember, uh, let's see here, where are you? It was, um, it was the Living Bible that actually put the phrase S-O-B, and if you don't know what that is, just don't worry about it, S-O-B in, um, in their Bible. That's, uh, that's profanity. That's profane. They put it in there. Okay, Vain babblings. Remember what I said about all these Bibles. They don't all say the same thing alike. It's hard to follow. It's hard to understand. One will say one thing. One will say another. Which one am I supposed to believe here? It's, it's babblings because it comes from the Tower of Babel. Shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You have to ask yourself the question. As a result of these moving in, is there more godliness in the church or is there less godliness in the church? I'll leave it up to you. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So right here, the Apostle Paul is saying their word will eat as a canker or a cancer, and it will overthrow the faith of some. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And Paul was warning us to watch out for their word. It eats as a cancer, and it's going to overthrow the faith of people. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle, think about that, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I fear lest by any means, by any means, think about that, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be cor corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Let me let's see if I can explain this. Okay? Reading one Bible is simple. Okay? And just following one Bible and following... Have you, have you ever been part of an organization where the people at the top, they weren't getting along and nobody really knew what they were doing? And how, how, how did you know who, who you were going to follow? One person wanted to go one way, one person said another. Or, or you remember when you were children... And your parents, you went to your parents, you went to your dad. Dad, uh, can we do this? Um, well, yeah, I think so. You go to your mom. Your mom says, no, absolutely not. And you're going, well, what are we going to do here? Okay? All of a sudden, life is not simple anymore. And you're part of an organization where the people at the top, one's going one way, one's ta talking about another thing, and it's all confusion. And you're going, I don't know what to do. It's just easy to have one person say, this is what we're going to do. That's what one Bible in a church represents. It represents the simplicity. We're going to follow this one book, whatever it says. This is our agreed to standard. This is how we're going to go. This is, how we're, this is who we're going to follow. But now in the churches, oh, you've got the New Bible and the NIV and the New King James and the Living One and the Revised One and the New American One. You've got all these different Bibles that are saying different things. How do you, it's removing you from the simplicity. The, the devil always works through subtlety. Okay, now, um, we don't yet, yet have a Bible that you open it up on page one, and it says, Worship Satan. And on page two, Worship Satan. Page three, Worship Satan some more. Page four, Don't worship Jesus anymore. Page five, Worship Satan. We don't have that Bible yet. Okay? The devil knows that he could never get away with that. Okay? He could never get away with that. So he's got to work through subtlety, which means he... He's hiding his agenda. It's going to look good. Oh, it says, it says Bible. That says Bible. That says Bible. That says Bible. They all say, well, that one says book. But that means the Bible. They all say that they are a Bible. But there's, there's something here that's, there's an agenda. These are, these are the conspirators sitting at the table going, uh, we need to hide something. Acts chapter 13, verse 10. Uh, this is when Paul encountered... 
a guy that he called false prophet. His name was Bar Jesus in Acts chapter 13. Uh, Revelation chapter 13. There's a guy called false prophet. And his job was to lead everybody into worshiping the image of the beast. Okay, think about it. So here's a guy named false prophet. His name is Bar Jesus. And here's what Paul said about him. Acts chapter 13, verse 10. And he said, O full of subtlety, here it is, and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And you have to ask yourself, if, if this is the Bible, shouldn't there be, and the right ways of God, shouldn't there be the perversion of those ways. That's what these represent. You're not convinced yet. Hang with me. I'll show it to you. Okay? Daniel chapter 2 verse 9. Nebuchadnezzar had a vision. He had a dream. And when he woke up, he couldn't remember the dream. So he calls his, his astrologers, his occultists, his soothsayers, and all the palm readers and everything like that. He called these guys in and said, I had a dream last night and um, I, I need you to tell me what it means. And they said, King, if you'll just tell us the dream, we'll tell you what it means. Nebuchadnezzar said, I, I, I can't remember the dream. You tell me the dream. And they said, well, you tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it means. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was, he was figuring things out. It said in that Daniel chapter 2, verse 9, But if thou wilt not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. And, and I'm going to show you, okay, that these are lying and corrupt words to mis... See, these guys were going to mislead Nebuchadnezzar on the truth. Who was it that showed up? Daniel showed up on the scene, and he said, here's what God's going to do. God, I don't have it in me, Nebuchadnezzar. God is going to give you both the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And we see that in Daniel chapter 2. And so this, this vision that Nebuchadnezzar had was about this, this image. Think about it, the image that everybody's going to worship. They worshiped it in Daniel chapter 3. And uh, in Daniel chapter 7, you see that uh, the, uh, Daniel is describing this fourth kingdom, this fourth beast that rises up, and describing what he's going to do. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 11, this beast has great words. In Daniel 7, verse 25, he has great words against the Most High. These Bibles, I'll prove it, represent great words against the Most High. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul said, "In my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Notice Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You know what Paul is saying here? Vain words will lead to the wrath of God upon children of disobedience. Colossians chapter 2, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you, with enticing words. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is a witness. You know what he's saying here? Flattering words are meant to cloak something. They're meant to cover something up. Now, I believe in a devil. I believe that he's subtle. I believe he's like a snake. He's a serpent. And serpents don't just walk up to you making a bunch of noise. They're down low. They slither through the grass. And, they're, and they use that grass or whatever it is as a cloak, a covering for them. This, this doctrine of the Antichrist is being covered up. It's being cloaked. Doctrines of Satan and what his name is and how he works and how he will appear to people is being covered up by the conspirators who are all conspiring together to corrupt the Word of God and to cover up the true conspiracy that's going on right now. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words 
to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Paul is, tell, is warning us about words that are intended to subvert. You know what subversion is, don't you? That's what spies do. They go in undercover. They look like part of the people. They look like spies will get in on the other side's team and be part of that group. Remember Judas? Spies will get in under subversion, undercover, and they'll be part of the other group's team. Undercover cops work this way, and they're trying to find out what their secrets are, what they're doing, and then they'll report back to the other side. Their whole methodology is about subversion, and these books are intended to subvert those who used to listen to this one. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 3, And through covetousness shall they with, notice this here, feigned words, Make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. You know what feigned words are? You're going to like this. Pretend. Okay? Pretend. Pretend words. You ever, had, you ever had somebody that was trying to act like they were your friend, and they would say all kinds of nice things about you, but behind your back they were cutting you down, and they were slamming you amongst everybody, and you found it out. You later found it out, and you said, well... What about all those nice things they said? They were, they were feigned words. They were pre pretend words. See, this is the Holy Bible, King James Version. This is the Holy Bible, New King James Version. It's pretending to be a Bible, but it's not. It's trying to subvert. The Living Bible, Life Application Bible, New International Version of the Bible. Uh, all of these are pretending to be the Word of God. But they're not. I'm going to keep going. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those who were clean escaped from them who live in error. You see, churches at one time, they all had one Bible. They were just all following the same rules. They may have seen it a little differently, but they were all following this. Now the great swelling words of vanity allured people. Oh, these are easier to read. This is easier to understand. We can do this one better. And they were meant to, to bring those out through wantonness, those who were clean escaped from those who lived in error. It's meant to bring people away from this book. You don't believe that? You don't believe me? Show me a church now. Show me a church now that stands solidly on the King James Bible. There, there are those out there. And when you stand solidly on the King James Bible, you say, you know what? We're not using these others. The churches who will use, let's say the NIV, will also tell you, you know what? You can use the NIV. You can use the New Living Translation. You can use the New King James. You can even use the New American. You can use all of these Bibles. It, it's all the Word of God. Well, really, you probably shouldn't use the King James Bible. That's what you're hearing. Third, third John, verse 10. Listen to this. John said, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. Malicious. That means there was an evil intent in the words, and they were prating against us. John, the same John who said, that which we've handled of the word of life. He said that the words of life we can actually hold in our hands. He was meaning the Bible. But he said, there are people who are coming out against us with malicious words. And not content with therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. That's an agenda. See, these guys all have a conspiracy. Okay? Get everybody away from the King James Bible because there's a cover-up. Psalm chapter 36. Look at this one. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Listen to this. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. Verse 3. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. The words, the words of his mouth are iniquity and they are deceit. 
They're not telling you the truth. Now, for those of you who don't really know anything about this issue, let me, let me kind of get where I'm going here. Okay? You've heard uh, from the people that you put trust in uh, behind a pulpit that uh, really all the Bibles are saying the same thing. You know what? That that kind of that kind of sounds like what all the people are saying now. How uh, we're all worshiping the same God, Rick Warren. Right after I came out with the biblical case against Rick Warren video, Rick Warren comes out with a with a news item says. We're trying to build a bridge with all the Muslims in the world because, after all, we worship the same God. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. You see, our God has a son. His name is Jesus Christ. The Muslims, in fact, the Muslims get mad. They get really upset when you say that God has a son. They said, Allah has no son. We're not worshiping the same God, Rick. Okay? So, what's coming out of the pulpits is... Um, Really, all the Bibles are really, they're all saying the same thing. They're all full of Christian doctrine and Christian goodness and every, that, that's, that's what they're saying, okay? But it's not true because these Bibles will change the image of Jesus Christ and they will cloak the image of both the devil and the Antichrist. This, this is what we're going to talk about today and I want you to bear with me. Okay, I want you to at least hear the evidence, hear the arguments, because I'm just going to compare this with all of these guys over here, and then you make the decision. Okay, you, you make the call, you decide which way it's going to be for you. Is that fair enough? Okay, so let's get started. One of the, one of the things that I, I was hearing, and you read this on the prophecy blogs, and you read this from, you know, hear it from other people. They're referring to the Antichrist as a guy called the man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness. And I, I, I checked with, um, with all these other guys over here, and they pretty much all, all said the same thing. Um, it's interesting. Let's see, where are you? The New King James Version actually calls him in 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin in the text. But then it's got like a great big arrow, and it points you down to the bottom and it says some other manuscripts say lawlessness. So really the New King James Bible is a bridge. It's meant to, it's step one to get people from using the King James and its absolute authority to pointing them to the direction that, did you know that other manuscripts actually say something else here? Why, no. And so you go check with the NIV and it says lawlessness. You go check with the book and it says lawlessness. You go check with the New American Standard and it says, let, let me read the text. Let me tell you where I'm going here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Stop right here. Here we go. How, how, how many means? Any means. Let no man deceive you by any means. Did you know that even Paul is warning against people named Michael Hoggard? Okay? Don't let me deceive you by any means. Even if I, I can, I have the ability to quote the King James, but listen to what falls out of my mouth after I say that. And if I ever say anything like, now really what this verse should have said is, then you, gotta, you know I'm doing something. Or I should have said, now in the context of ancient Greece, this really was, see, then I'm up to something. So I'm going to just I'm just going to try to just give you scripture here, and you believe this, or you believe this. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away. We're actually going to see that in the Bible, by the way. A falling away first, and the man of sin, man of sin, is what the King James calls him. Be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, I'm going to show you, you may not like this, but I'm going to show you how this works. Okay? So that he, as God, he, as God, he, he, this is pretending to be this. He is God, thy word have I hid in my heart, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And you have whole people who have had nothing about the NIV and the New Living Translation and the New American... They've had nothing but that in their lives. 
he as God. This is pretending to be this, okay? But, so let's get to it. Um, here we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. In the, uh, this could be, I think it's the NIV, but it could be the NIV, the New American Standard. It, it's basically what all these guys say, okay? Uh, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. Um, that's not really the same thing, okay? Falling away is, is what the King James says. Uh, but anyway, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. You see, they've even changed his name. He was, in the King James, the son of perdition. I'll show you who that is in a minute. But now they says he's just doomed to destruction. But they call him the man of lawlessness. And you have to ask the question, is that really true? Is the Antichrist going to be like so totally anarchist and without rules, without any laws whatsoever? Is that what he's going to do? Because that's what the man of lawlessness would, would indicate, that he's just no laws whatsoever. Okay? Um, that's not really true according to the Bible because in Daniel chapter 7, Remember that phrase where he says, speaks great words against the Most High? Let's go back and look at that verse again. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. It doesn't say here that he's going to do away with all the laws. It said he's going to change them. Oh, there will be laws. They'll just be his laws. He's not a man of lawlessness. You say, well, you're just kind of, you know, making semantics. Let's, let's move on. You see, the King James refers to him as the son of perdition. In fact, there's only two places in the whole Bible that uses that. Here in 2 Thessalonians, and then in, um, I think it's uh, the Gospel of John, where Jesus was talking about Judas, whom he called the son of perdition. What is, what is perdition? Perdition is hell. It's destruction. That's literally what it means. It's the lake of fire. I want you to notice there's actually a, 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 a witness in the Bible to this phrase, son of perdition. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, when Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees, look what, look what he said. He said, you're going to compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the what? Child of hell than yourselves. That's essentially what the son of perdition is. You say, well, is hell, is hell a woman? Yeah, the Bible says that she is. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14, therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth. Hell's a woman. And I want you to think about this, okay? And think about a possible cover-up, a conspiracy. The Bible says that our Jesus, the one that we're waiting for, the Messiah, is going to come down from heaven. He's birthed literally from heaven. Okay, New Jerusalem is the mother of Saul, the Bible says. So he's birthed from heaven. Uh, he's going to come down from heaven. Um, the Antichrist is not coming down from heaven. Where is he coming from? Hell. Hell literally is going to give birth to to him. That's how it's going to happen. The Muslims, remember, Rick says that they all worship the same God as we do. Did you know the Muslim Messiah, the Imam Mahdi? He's, I thought that he was coming down. He's not. The Muslim idea of their Savior says that he's in a well. He's way down buried deep in the heart of the earth and he's going to rise up out of that. He's going to come and change the world for for Islam. He's going to make everybody good Muslims. Uh, they're already working on that right now, by the way. Um, he literally, literally is the son of perdition. And I want to, I want to show you this. 1 Samuel chapter 4. I want to show you how the Bible speaks in prophetic types. For every New Testament doctrine, or every doctrine in the Bible, there's always a story that plays it out perfectly so that you understand what's going on. See, he's not just someone who is doomed to destruction the way these guys say. He literally is the son of perdition. And so Paul warned us in 2 Thessalonians 2, he said, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, not a rebellion, 
of falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He's literally going to be birthed. There's a story in the Old Testament that tells you exactly what's going to happen, including, you remember how Paul said, uh, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So something's going to be taken out of the way. There's going to be a falling away, and a child is going to be born. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18. Remember the days of Eli, the high priest, the days when Samuel was a young boy. He was in a lot of trouble over his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and God pronounced a judgment upon Eli. The Philistines came, and they took away the ark of the covenant, God's mercy seat, his throne. Look what happened. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side, that's the falling away, by the side of the gate, and his neck break, and he died for he was an old man. First Samuel chapter 4, verse 19, notice what happened right after that. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. What is it that we're supposed to be looking for? A travailing. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. There in this story is a falling away. The ark of God, the mercy seat of God, is taken out of the way. And the man of sin, the son of perdition, literally is born right here. The glory of God is departed. That's why they called him Ichabod. So I think that this Bible's right, and these guys are all wrong. Why are they wrong? I think they're trying to cover something up. You're going you're gonna to see this in this one. Isaiah chapter 14. I've used this part of the scriptures in a lot of the teachings. When I talk about conspiracies, I, this is like the conspiracy right here. This is it, okay? Uh, this reveals the heart of Satan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent, um, um, all of the Belial, um, Beelzebub, all these names that we ascribe to uh, the devil, but he actually has a, a proper name. Just like God has a proper name, uh, the devil has a proper name name. According to the King James Bible, that name is Lucifer. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou, notice here, uh, here we have something falling again, by the way. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou fallen, notice we have something here falling away. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now, um, if you ask any, any pastor who does not use King James, any Bible scholar, if you go online, they're going to tell you, now, the name Lucifer, the King James translators, they came up with this dumb name. They didn't even get it from the original. They got it from, like, Latin. And they're, they're going to tell you that they made up the name Lucifer or somebody else did. And they said, you know, that, that's what we're going to use. Okay? That's what they're going to say. They're going to try to tell you that really the, the word Lucifer should not even be there, that, that that's really not his name. And they're going to tell you that there's an error here and the translators got it all wrong. Really, you should just read all these books here because they're better. Okay, It's what they're going to say. Let's break it down. Lucifer, it, it actually is a Latin word and, and uh, all of our words come from Latin, French, uh, some Spanish, Greek, uh, you know, Proto-Indian. We just, we speak a mingled language here. And so the word Lucifer, it's, it's broken down into two parts, lucis, which means light. Actually, the word light in English is a French word. Any word with G-H in it is, is like from French. And the French got the word light from the Latin, which is lucis. Okay, so we have lucis, which is light. And we have fur or ferret. That's a Latin root as well. And it means to bear, to carry, or to bring as a messenger. Okay, so the word lucifer means the bringer of light or like a messenger of light. That's literally what the name Lucifer means. It means messenger of light. God showed me that there's actually a New Testament witness 
to the name Lucifer and that the King James translators actually they got it right. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into, here it is, an angel of light. You know what an angel, you know the angel comes from the Greek word angelos. You know what that means? Messenger, a bearer of a message, a carrier, a letter carrier. That's what, that's what it means. Okay, so the name Lucifer and the phrase angel of light, th they got it right. The, the translators here, in putting the name Lucifer here, were accurately describing both his name and his character. That's who he is. Now, uh, the interesting thing, and I don't do this much, but I do happen to know the Hebrew that is in Isaiah chapter 14 where it says, O Lucifer, I happen to know the Hebrew. It's a, it's a word called halal. Okay, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it in Hebrew, but that's just how it's you know, kind of pronounced. Halal. Okay? Now, all of the other translations will call him morning star. Okay? The word halal actually means uh, like the bright one. Okay? And is that correct according to the scriptures? Well, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we see that Lucifer is covered with precious stones, sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. Did you know that all of those precious stones do one thing and they do it very, very well? They carry light. They don't have light in and of themselves, but they'll take light from the original source and they'll carry it out. Well, all of these stones literally are light bearers. Okay? It refers to him in Ezekiel chapter 28 as the anointed cherub. So he was an angel, a messenger of light. Ezekiel 28 verse 17 talks about the, the, the reason of thy brightness. Well, that's literally what the word halal means. Now, all of the other translations like the NIV and the New American Standard, here's what they say should really, according to, the, you know, according to what we, here's what really should be in the text. They call him in the NIV, O Morning Star. They call him in the NSB, the Star of the Morning, which is kind of interesting because, I mean, I don't know much about um, Hebrew, but I, I did look that word up, and the word morning is not there. I mean, it's just not, the word morning is not contained in that Hebrew phrase. It's not there. They got it from some place. Even the Revi Revised Standard Version, here it is down here, says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Day star, and they even went so far as to capitalize day star for you. Uh, I have a huge problem with that because when they call him the morning star and they call him day star, um, let's go to this King James here, Second Peter chapter one verse nineteen. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The Revised Standard Version is actually saying that Lucifer is going to rise up in your hearts. That's, that's not right. Um, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. You see, these Bibles are trying to, I, they're covering up something. They're, they're not telling you his real name. His real name is Lucifer, the angel of light. They're telling you that the one who fell from heaven is the day star or the morning star. And when you start reading and you're going, wait a minute, I thought the day star was Jesus. Why is it, why is it that the devil is trying to act like Jesus, the morning star, the day star, why, why, is, why is he trying to do that? Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 14 where it calls him correctly Lucifer. And look at verse 14 and let's see what's in Lucifer's heart. He said, I will be like who? The most high. Who's the most high? It's God. It's Jesus. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, And he shall speak great words against who? 
the Most High. Here, this Bible, the King James, correctly identifies who Lucifer is and what his name and what his character is. And it's telling you he's going to try to look like God. Remember, he is God sitteth in the temple of God. The day star is wanting to rise in your hearts. These Bibles are telling you that Lucifer has now become Jesus. He's like the most high. Revelation chapter 5. Listen to this one. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. Now we know who that is, don't we? We know who the lion is. We know who the lion is. The lion of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David, is Jesus. And he alone is worthy to open the book. Notice in Revelation chapter 10, verse 3, we have a mighty angel, I believe it's Jesus, who cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. Notice Isaiah 31, 4, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion, and for the hill thereof. You know, the Bible's telling you that, number one, Jesus is the, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's telling you that when he comes down, he's going to roar like a lion and he's going to scare off all the shepherds that are against him. I like that. Notice 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, notice this, how is he going to appear? As... A roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is trying to masquerade as the lion of the tribe of Judah, roaring. And the Bible says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And you know what I'm doing? I'm resisting. Okay? I'm not buying the morning star, day star interpretation of Isaiah chapter 14 because I recognize that that's Lucifer trying to hide himself for who he really is and tried to masquerade as the morning star, the day star, Jesus, as the lion, as the lion. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Here it is again. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled thee through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, here it is, Another Jesus. Another Jesus. Not, not, not the real one, but the fake one. A masquerading Jesus. A roaring lion. A morning star falling from heaven. A day star falling from heaven. Rising up in your hearts. It's a masquerade. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Oh, this is, uh, this is the Word of God. This is, this is Jesus right here. The, all, these, all these Bibles, really, if you put them all together, even though they're babbling against one another, if you put them all together, they'll make Jesus. Okay? Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, the anointed one, the holy one of Israel, holy Bible. I am Christ and shall deceive many. You see, there's the real lion, and there's the fake lion. Which one, which one are you going to believe? Let's look at another issue. This one I've been aware of for a long time now, and I want to show you how this works. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. This is the King James Version. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Stop right here. All Bibles have a spirit. Okay? All of them. They have a spirit. Okay? One of them is going to have the Holy Spirit, but all of them can't. Let's see. The Holy Spirit. Let's see. The Bible that calls the guy the SOB, that's, that's not holy. Um, prof profanity and vain jangling and all these things. So the Bibles are going to have a spirit. And we're warned not to believe every spirit, but to try the spirits, whether they are of God. You, f you figure this out on your own. God helped me. God will help you, okay? I, that's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to sit and I want you to think about it now. I want you to ponder it and think about it. Think about now. You're going to be told from a bunch of other preachers that Mike Hoggart is a liar and he's an idiot and he's wrong. He's all kinds of things. They're going to say all kinds of things. Don't listen to me. You just, you just get alone. And you just read this one 
and read these. You make a decision. Okay? Try the spirits. Um, because many false prophets are gone out. How many? Many of them. There's a bunch of new Bibles out there. Are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God. Here, I'm going to show you this. John, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is going to say, here's how you're going to know. Here's how you're going to know. Oh, this is so simple. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ, notice these words, is come in the flesh, is of God. So the King James is telling you, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. Okay? Now verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. And so John is saying, you know what? Even though the beast has not risen up out of the pit yet, his spirit is already here and it's already at work. And, and he's saying, here's how you're going to identify. Here's, he said, it's just real simple. Real simple. Okay? Here's how you identify the spirit. If it's the Spirit of Christ, it will, it, will, it will witness and bear witness that Jesus Christ, God, has come in the flesh. And if it's the Spirit of Antichrist, it will not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. You ready? NIV. NIV Bible. You decide. Here's what the NIV says in that exact verse. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. See, it'll tell you there's a spirit of Antichrist, but it just concealed something. It just hid something. It doesn't want you to know. The phrase, is come in the flesh, is missing out of this Bible. It is unconfessed. So, I mean, you just, you just take it for what it is, okay? This Bible said, if, this, if it doesn't say that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then it's the spirit of Antichrist. And this, the NIV, doesn't say that he's come in the flesh. This is the spirit. It's, it's covered up. They, they took it out. They don't want you to know how to recognize the spirit of Antichrist. They don't, they don't want you to know it. They took it out. These guys... We're all in a conspiracy together against the Lord and against His anointed. That's Psalm chapter 2. Uh, the mark. Everybody knows that the beast is going to have a mark, right? It's going to have a mark. It's going to mark everybody. Here is um, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, according to the King James Bible. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, I want, you to, I want you to focus here on the phrase, and I stood upon the sand of the sea. You see, for, uh, I'm going to say over 400 years, because we know that the King James Bible was uh, the, the, the work after what was the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible, uh, Tyndale's Bible, Wycliffe's Bible. And uh, they were all pretty much in agreement on, on, on practically everything here. And uh, so at least, at least now, for, for the last 400 years, the church has been taught, because it's been read from this one book, the church has been taught that John is the one who stood upon the sand of the sea. Okay? And I, I did not know this until yesterday when I'm putting these notes together. John said, I stood upon the sand of the sea. Um, the NIV and the New American Standard and all these other Bibles, here, here's what they say. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Why? And the New American Standard has the same reading. Now, here's what you, now, really, here's what they say about the New American Standard. The New American Standard really is the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew. You know, if you ask a hundred pastors wh why they use the New American Standard, they will, they will say exactly the same thing. It's like they got a letter in the mail saying, say this. Okay? How is it that they know that? They, they only know it because I had a pastor friend of mine say, well, I use the New American Standard because it's the most literal to the Hebrew and Greek. 
You know what I knew about him? He didn't study the Hebrew and Greek. He did he didn't study he didn't he did not sit down with the Greek text and and actively compare massive volumes of the King James and the New American Standard and say, you know, I think the New American Standard is actually more accurate to the Greek and it's more literal. He didn't do that. You know what he did? He did what he was told. Let me tell you about the New American Standard Bible. Let me tell you about a guy named Frank Logsdon. You know who he was? They, these guys don't want you to know who Frank Logston was. Frank Logston was a scholar that they hired. They was going to pay him very well to be part of the New American Standard Translation Committee. And he was told, man, we're just, you know, we're going to get a Bible that's literal to the Greek and Hebrew. Oh, okay. And uh, it's, going to, it's going to help the church. It's going to help people understand God. He got on the committee, started work on it. He found out they had an agenda. He found out that there was a, a conspiracy. He saw them. They were changing the Bible. They were going with, the, with texts that should not be gone with. You know what he did? He said, I quit. And he went around. He spent the remaining years of his life exposing the conspiracy that was in the New American Standard Translating Committee and saying, just stick with the King James. Trust it. One of their guys came out and told what was going on. But why is in these Bibles the dragon standing on the shore of the sea? In the Bible language, when you're standing on something, you own it. Okay, You have dominion over it. And you just chase that down through the Bible, that's what you'll see. Do you know what the symbolism of the sand of the, of the shore of the sea is? Genesis chapter 22. This is when uh, Abram is taking Isaac, his only son, up to Mount Moriah to offer him up. Here's what God said because of that. That in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee, thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. You know who the enemies is? The gates of our enemies is the gates of hell. And the promise of Jesus was that my church, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And God is promising right here that the seed of Abraham will literally be able to stand against and possess the gates of hell, our enemy. Our enemy is Satan. But now we see in the new Bibles, Satan has gained dominion over the sand of the seashore. He's standing on them. He says, I own you. You're not going to go possess my gate. Conspiracy. Let's get to the mark. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. King James Bible. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Count things. There's six things here, by the way. And that's interesting because the mark is all associated with the number six. Uh, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. To receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay, now that's, that sounds pretty simple. Let me notice that it says the word in. In. NIV, New American Standard, all these other guys. Um, I'm going I'm to deal with this. Here's what the NIV says. He also forced everyone. Now I'm going to stop right here. Because I, I don't think that they forced anybody. I don't think they're going to force anybody. The King James says, causeth all. Okay? Uh, you can be really slick and you can cause your kids to do pretty much anything. I used to do this with my, with my girls when it's time to clean up their room. I'd say, come on, let's, let's race. Let's see who can get it done the quickest. And boy, they fell for it every time until they you know, turn like 12. And then the dad, we know what you're doing. Okay? I could cause my kids to clean their room up. And they would do it glad, willingly. You see, I had this idea when I was a kid. I'd heard preaching out of the book of Revelation all my life. Preachers were telling it. They were saying, you know, look, people, at some point they're going to come in with guns and they're going to take all of our Bibles away. I remember getting a Gideon King James Bible when I was in fifth grade. That was back when they could give them out in public schools. And I took that Bible and God put it in my heart. I just, I said, you know what? I don't want to take my Bible away. I'm a Christian. Young boy. And I took that red little New Testament King James Bible they give out to kids in school. And I hid that up in the attic of our house under the insulation. And I said, you know what? If they come in my house and take all the Bibles, they won't know that one's there. And after they leave, I'll still have a Bible. I love the Bible. The devil has tried to take away my Bible. See, I come from... 
these are the guys I used to hang around with. I didn't know that the devil was trying to take this away from me. Okay? <clears throat> I didn't know that there was actually an active plan even then to take all the Bibles away from people. They never had to fire a shot. Never had to fire a shot. You see, I don't, all the Bibles, now, all, all, all these King James Bibles, go to a church now, find out what they're using. In almost every case, this is the company they're hanging around. And everybody's, everybody's carrying these Bibles. Got the, That's what you find at the bookstores, and that's what everybody's... They've walked away from this. People, people handed them in voluntarily. See, I don't think the false prophet is going to force anyone to get a mark. He's just going to set up a situation where they're all going to do it voluntarily. That's what's happened here. So, I have a problem with that. Anyway, back to the NIV. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave... Uh, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead. Um, that's a big, it, one letter. W one letter is changed and it makes a big difference. See, if it's, if it's on my right hand, everybody can see it. <gasps> He's got a mark. On a, you know, I wouldn't, you know, getting in and out of amusement parks, they want to stamp your hand. I wouldn't let them stamp my right hand. Uh-uh, you, you do that one. Uh, you're not putting a mark on this hand, okay? Um, a mark. So, so all of these people that are reading and they're, they're studying all these Bibles here, they're going to say, you know what? If they come and they try to put a mark on my right hand or on my forehead, I'm not going to let them do that because, yeah. Um, but that's, that's not where it's going to be. It's going to be in the right hand or in the forehead. I say, ah, you're, you're crazy. You, you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. I want to show you something very, very revealing and very interesting. This is concerning the sealing of the 144,000 of the tribes of Israel. Now, I am, um, I'm going to stop right here, Okay. I believe the tribes of Israel are the tribes of Israel. Issachar, Manasseh, Joseph, Judah. I believe that they are literally the descendants of all 12 of those brothers who were born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what I believe. And I'll tell you this. Any and every false doctrine has along with it somehow, some way, a misidentification or replacement of the tribes of Israel. Mark it down. So we have the seal of God on or in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 7, King James. See, I almost, almost fell for it. Revelation 7 verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom is given to hurt this earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have, that was the exact language, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Sealed the servants of God in their their foreheads. That's what the King James says. In. Sealed in. The NIV and all these guys over here, all the conspirators. Notice what they say. Revelation 7, 3 in the NIV. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until, look at the language, until we have put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Put a seal of the foreheads on the foreheads of our God. Okay? Put a seal on their foreheads. That's like saying that if you want to be part of the 144,000, you've got to have a seal, a mark on your forehead. Have you ever seen that before? Take a look at this. You've, you've seen this before, haven't you? It's called the bendy. You know what it, you know what it is? Okay. It's a mark on the forehead. It's a mark on the forehead. Uh, Buddhists do this, and uh, the Hindus do this. 
they, they say it represents, uh, it, it's part of kundalini, it's part of the, the awakening, the, the awareness, the, the, uh, the, uh, the reformation of the human being, turning a, a mortal into a god. Here's what it means. Okay, in Kundalini, they say that you have. Listen to this now. You're gonna like this. In Kundalini, which is uh, part of yoga. By the way, um, all these churches that have these, they're starting to do yoga now. Okay, but in yoga or Kundalini or tantric uh, fornication, they actually have rituals that go along with this. That whatever. Anyway, um, they uh, there's they say that there's a a, a serpent. They say, boy, the serpent, he's good. He's a real wise serpent's very, very wise. And they say there's a serpent buried down at the base of your spine. And he wants to rise up. Think about that. He wants to rise up and activate this little part of your brain that's like right here. It's right behind here called the pineal gland. Okay, so the, the serpent wants to rise up and inject his, his wisdom juice and activate your pineal gland, and you have this awakening. Here's the interesting thing. You know, we, we, everybody has a pineal gland. You know what it's for? Uh, the pineal gland is activated by light or deactivated by light. At night, when all the lights go down, the pineal gland is noting from the eyes that it's dark outside, and it starts releasing a little chemical that makes us sleepy. And in the morning when the sun comes out and its light comes to our windows, the pineal gland is detecting the light through our very, very thin eyelids. And it, then it stops releasing that little chemical. And then we go, oh, I'm awake now. But see, in the new age, in the occult world, they say that pineal gland activation makes you awake. It, it, it doesn't. It, it's putting you into a sleep. Think about that. Okay? But that's, that's what this mark on their forehead represents. It means that they have been activated. They've had their eyes. You know what it's called? It's called the third eye. Remember what Lucifer the serpent promised in the Garden of Eden to Eve? He said, if you, if you eat of this fruit, you'll have your eyes open and you shall be as... God's little G. Think about that. It's called the third eye. Um, it's actually on the. It, it's what's represented on the. Notice. Notice this graphic here. This guy with his third eye activated. That's the bendy. That's the mark on the forehead. Okay. He has two eyes here, and he has one eye here in the middle of his forehead. That makes it like a little triangle. If you look on the back of the one dollar bill, that's exactly what that symbol represents. The two lower parts of the pyramid represent your lower base self that you can only see with two eyes. But that eye there at the apex of the triangle, the all-seeing eye, illuminated. It's awake. It's open. They're telling you that through this activation of your pineal gland by way of this mark on your forehead, now you're going to be... A, so here all these churches now that are using these Bibles are all talking about a great awakening that's coming. We're all going to have a great awakening. I, 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 I don't think that they're talking about the same thing that this Bible is talking about. The Roman Catholic Church. Let me, let me just say this. If there's anybody, if there's any one organization in the world that is actively trying to get everybody in the world away from this Bible. It's the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church. They tried back in 1604 to 1611. They tried to get involved and make sure that this, this Bible was never translated right. They hated it. They hated England. For, for, they hated King James for even doing it. They have hated this Bible for four hundred years now. And their goal was to get every church in the world away from this Bible. It's working. Roman Catholic Church on Ash Wednesday. Roman Catholic Church says on Fat Tuesday, uh, go drink, smoke, chase women, chase men, do everything in the world, eat lots of fat, and all that stuff uh, because uh, tomorrow you're going to give it all up okay? in devotion to something. So on Ash Wednesday, you show up and they put a mark, the seal of God. It's, oh, it's a cross. It's Jesus. They put a mark on your forehead. 
That's what Revelation in the NIV 7 says. They're going to put a seal or cut the mark on the forehead of the 144,000. You see, Roman Catholicism, they hate, they hate the Israelites. They hate them. They've hated them for years. Okay? Um, they have a replacement theology. They believe that now all the Roman Catholics are the real Israel. See, it's replacement. Okay? So now, since we're the real Israel, we need to have a mark on our forehead because that's what all their Bibles say. Okay? We, have, we need to put a mark on their forehead. It actually marks what's called the 40 days of Lent. Now, uh, as, as I read the King James Bible, I don't see anything in here about the 40 days of Lent. I see that practice nowhere. Well, yeah, I do, actually. Um, it denotes the weeping. It's a time of mourning for the dead God. You know who the dead God is? It's the dead Jesus that they carry around on the cross everywhere. You see, Roman Catholicism is all about the dead Jesus. You know what the Mass is? The Mass is that they're killing Jesus all over again. It's called the sacrifice of the Mass. They are killing Jesus every time the Mass is performed. And so Lent is about uh, the weeping for the dead God who is in the underworld... And he's going to rise up. See, they put ashes on your head. He's going to rise up from the ashes. Think of, think of the serpent, Kundalini. See, it's all the same mystery doctrine, different names. The serpent is the dead God, and he needs to rise up out of the low place that he's in, called hell. He's going to rise up out of the ashes and come to life again. That actually is in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 8, King James. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13, He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. You know who Tammuz was? Ta you listen to this now, because we're going to see it again. Tammuz was a son of the gods who had been slain, he had been killed, and he was buried, and he was in the netherworld, he was in Hades, he was under fire. And all these women, see, the Israelites had picked up quickly on the Babylonian mystery religion. Roman Catholicism has been around for thousands of years, just under a different name. And they had followed this thing. Rick Warren's 40 Days of Purpose is based upon Lent. Okay, that's what it's based on. And uh, so they're weeping for Tammuz. They're weeping, they're mourning, they're lamenting him. That's what Lent is all about. But here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Okay? And I'm going to show you, you're going to like this. Okay, let's go back to this picture again of this ash mark on people's foreheads. Did you know that every year, every year, Ash Wednesday, even though it marks a 40 day period of Lent, Ash Wednesday is precisely. 46 days before Easter. What does that have to do with anything? Did you know that you have little X's in your body called chromosomes? you know how many of them you have? You have 46. We've talked about this on many videos that we've done. The number 46 is the number for death and sacrifice and everything like that. It is, it is, the number 46 is one of the high occult numbers. It denotes the, the rebuilding or the reestablishment of the old religion that worshipped Tammuz and all these other gods who had been slain, these sons of the gods. We're going to talk about them here in just a little bit. Um, we're going to go to the book of Daniel. In fact, I, I want to make this real simple. Okay, I like to make things simple. If people call me and say, well, what about my Bible? Is it, is it any good? Or what about this Bible? What about that Bible? And I was actually with a pastor in Kenya. Very good. We've become very good friends, and I love him dearly. And he was saying, Pastor Hoggard, uh, we have uh, many translations here. How do I know? Uh, we were looking at a Swahili Bible. In Kenya, they speak English, they speak Swahili, and then they have tribal dialects like Luo. Pastor Hoggard, how, how can I recognize if this Swahili Bible is, is correct? And I said, Pastor, to just look at two real simple places in the Bible. One of them is, who, who is it that fell from heaven in Isaiah 14? And so we looked it up in the Swahili Bible that we were in. A, we were in a Christian bookstore in, in Nairobi. Looked it up in the Swahili Bible there. 
And in Swahili, it said that the morning star fell from heaven. And he looked at me and he said, oh no. And I said, there's actually another place. Let's just, let's just get two witnesses here. Number one, ask yourself in Isaiah 14, who fell from heaven? Number two is where we're going to go here. Who is it that was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as their Savior? Who is the Savior of the Hebrews? Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. He answered, this is Nebuchadnezzar, answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like, and I want you to notice the exact wording here, the, which means like there's only one, the Son of God. The Son of God. And I, I remember, even as a, as a child, reading that in the old King James, I'm going, well, yeah, that's Jesus. Wow, Jesus was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach. That is, like, so cool. See, I just believed it. I didn't know that all these guys were conspiring against the Son of God. Remember the lion. The lion is always going to, the, the devil is always going to try to be like the Most High. It, see, it says Bible. It uses the word Jesus in here and other, but it, it, is it really? Is it really? Two simple tests. Number one, who fell from heaven in Isaiah 14? And who is it that was the Savior of the Hebrew children in Daniel chapter 3 in the fiery furnace? The NIV, New American Standard, and all the rest. Here's what they say. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. That is not the son of God. That is not the son of God. It's a roaring lion, but it's not the lion of the tribe of Judah. You see, where did they get that from? Because in all the mystery religions, every one of them, they all had a, a hero who was the offspring of a god, and in most cases, a human woman. The offspring of a god and a human woman. Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they made, they made children. Sons were born unto them. Children came unto them. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. These hybrid children are the ones that are spoken of in all the Greek, Roman, um, Babylonian, Sumerian legends. Every one of them. They all talk about, Egyptians, they all talk about a, 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 a hero who was the son of a god and of a human woman. Horus. Horus was the son of Osiris, the sun god, and Isis, the fertility goddess. The fertility goddess that, you know how you worship the fertility goddess? You figure it out, okay? Uh, uh, Osiris, the sun god, and, um, and Isis, the, 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 the earth woman, they mated, and they produced a child called Horus. There's, you know what Horus' sign is? This is called the eye of Horus. It's the, it's the all-seeing eye the mark on the forehead. Baal. Boy, did the Israelites ever have a problem with Baal. They had a continuing huge problem with Baal. They were always worshiping Baal. They were following after Baal. Baal is described in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27, as the God who is asleep and must be awakened. That's the serpent who's asleep at the base and down in the lower parts and is going to be awakened when he reaches your pineal gland. That's that's who Elijah described, that's how he described Baal. Um, Baal, Beelzebub, Belial, Beltane, the, the pagan holiday of Beltane, they all referenced the name Baal. You know who Baal was? He, was? he was the son of Dagon. He was the son of Dagon. You know, the Dagon priests, they wore these little fish hats. Think of that. Think of, think of the, the, the religion in this world whose priests and bishops still wear the headdress of Dagon who had a son whose name was Baal. Tammuz. Tammuz was a son of the gods. 
his mother, his mother was the queen of heaven. And in the book of Jeremiah, they were baking cakes to the queen of heaven, and God said it's an abomination. The priests who wear the Dagon fish hats, they always call Mary the queen of heaven. Think about it. Okay? Um, and they eat little cakes, and they say, this is the God. See, they were baking cakes to the queen of heaven. And those cakes, according to their mystery religion, those cakes were the, the body of the dead God. And if they ate the God, they became the God. You get it? Okay? It's the doctrine of transubstantiation that's in the Roman Catholic Church, and which is now creeping in to Protestant, Baptist, Pentecost, you name it. It's, that doctrine is creeping in that if we eat the, uh, the, uh, the sacraments, the bread and the wine, if we eat that and take that on a daily basis, God's gonna, God is going to unleash all these good things in your life. It's a setup, people. It's coming out of Rome. It's coming out of mystery religions. Adonis. Adonis. Uh, he is the, uh, the Roman version of Tammuz, and he is the son of the gods and a human woman. You've heard of Apollo, haven't you? The Apollo rockets that went to the moon. Apollo is Apollyon. Apollo is the god of prophecy. He's the god of music. He is a son of the gods and of a human woman. Apollo, whose real name is Apollyon, you know where that word comes from? Revelation 9-11. He is the king of the bottomless pit. He's in the pit right now. He's in the ashes. He's going to rise out of the ashes by way of the mark on people's foreheads. Perseus was a son of the gods. He was the son of Zeus, who is Saturn, who is Satan. Thou child of the devil is what Paul called the false prophet in Acts chapter 13. I think he meant what he said. Because Perseus was a son of the gods. Percy Jackson, you remember this a series of books written by a guy, now it's a movie, Percy Jackson. Per, and I, boy, I, t I watched the first 10 minutes of Percy Jackson and the lightning thief, okay? Percy Jackson is this, oh, I think he's probably an 11-year-old boy. Think about that. And the opening scene shows him down in the bottom of a pool, and he's just sitting there. And all of a sudden, he rises up out of the water. That's exactly what John saw in Revelation 13 concerning the beast. You know who the beast is? He's a son of the gods, people. He's a son of the gods, not the Son of God, a Son of the Gods. And that's who Perseus is. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. You see, on his father's side, they were the ancient wizards. They, it, it, his, his father's side was a pure blood race of wizards. He is called, Harry Potter now is called the half-blood because his mother was just a mere mortal. She didn't have any magic powers. And so Harry Potter is a hybrid, a son of the gods. And oh, by the way, he has this mark on his forehead. Superman. I used to love, I, I'll tell you what, if I can get drawn into anything, it's Superman. I wanted to be Superman so bad, I couldn't stand it. Okay, I've read Superman comic books. I know I know a lot about Superman. Gold kryptonite. I know all the different kryptonites there are. Okay, um, Superman was invented by uh, two Jews, uh, Siegel and Schuster, and they they had this. They got the name actually from uh, German lore and mythology. I think a guy by the name of Nietzsche wrote about the Ubermensch, the God Man. That's what it means. And so in the movies, you see the first three movies, Superman, and in the second movie, he falls in love with Lois Lane, and okay, they were together. In the movie Superman Returns, which is the most recent, we find out then when Superman, the, the, the god who descended down from space, um, and she, Lois Lane in Superman 1 actually calls him holding hands with a god. She calls Superman a god. Um, it's like right in your face. Um, Superman, he falls down, he mates with this human woman, and we find out in Superman Returns that he's, he's got a son. Okay? He's just a little boy. But we find out that this son now is a mighty hero. He has the powers of his father. He is, and by the way, Superman's name, you know what Superman's name is? Not Clark Kent. 
His name was Kyle El. His father was Jor El. The name El, see these guys were Jews. The word El in Hebrew is God's name. El means a God. Jor El. That's who he is. The movie Starman. Same imagery. Same imagery. Okay? An alien falls from outer space and he takes on human form and he mates with uh, uh, this woman. And um, she teaches him about love because he doesn't know anything about that. And they fall in love and they mate. And then he tells her, you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a little boy. He is going to have my powers in him and he is going to be a great teacher in the world. So now, now you know who the son of the gods is. Now, I've been to Bible college. I know how they talk. Okay? They, 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 um, they give an apologetic for how they write it in their new Bibles. Well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was a, 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 a very well acquainted with all these gods. And in his mind, that's all he knew. He just knew a son of the God. He didn't know who he was referring to. That's a lie. That, that's, that's not in the Bible. Number one, they didn't read it from the Bible that that's why they say he said that. In fact, it's actually written in the Bible that Nebuchadnezzar knew exactly who he was looking at. It's actually in the Bible. And this is where I'm going to leave you. I think you need to know exactly who you're talking to. We have two young men in our church, Brady and Bradley. I love them. They are my sons in the Lord. Twin brothers. When I first met them, they were 16 years old. Identical twins. And back then, when I, when I would see them, they used to work at the McDonald's in, in our area. And I would go into McDonald's and I'd see one of them. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know which one was which. And I had to wait till they get up to me and they always had a name tag, Brady or Bradley. And I'd go, hey, Bradley, how you doing? You see, the, the differences between them at that age was very, very subtle. Think about it. I think you need to know who it is you're going to worship. Because we know that another Jesus is coming on the scene. We know that he is the anti-Christ, different one. He will come and say, I am Christ, and deceive many. He will speak great words and say, these are the words of God. That there will be a roaring lion. And people will think, well, that's the lion of the tribe of Judah. But it's, it's not. And I think you need to be like Nebuchadnezzar. I think you need to know who it is that you're worshiping. There is a difference. And I've tried to show you from this Bible and these, the difference. And so if you just, if you just you want to make it simple, ask yourself, in the Bible that I use, the Bible that my preacher preaches out of, number one, who is it that fell from heaven? And number two, who is the Savior of the Hebrews in the fiery furnace? If your Bible says that, number one, the morning star fell from heaven, and that the Savior of the Hebrews is a son of the gods, don't believe it. If, however, your Bible says that that was Lucifer, the angel of light that fell from heaven, and it says that the Son, the Son of God is the Savior of the Hebrews, you got it right. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, look at what Nebuchadnezzar said. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and once he saw, listen to this now, once he saw who that was in there, then this is what he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. He knew. He knew. Once he saw the Son of God and said, the Son of God, he then said, I know now you are the servants of the Most High God. Remember, Lucifer 
the one that fell says, I want to be like the Most High. You have a decision to make. I can't make it for you. I didn't want to make this decision. When I was hanging around these guys, I thought, you know, uh, this is how I'll be accepted in all the pulpits, and this is how people will come to my church. They'll like the fact that I'm not using that old King James anymore. I didn't want to make the decision. God helped me. And my decision is clear. I'm not ever going hanging around with these guys ever again. I'm going to follow the Bible that says Lucifer fell from heaven and that the Savior of the Hebrews is the Son of God. What will you decide? This is Pastor Mike. I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.